Hello, everyone, and welcome to um, the Epidemic Ethics Network event on Moral Frameworks for Collective Action in Epidemics. Um, my name is Barbara Preinsack, and I'm going to just wait for another minute uh, to give colleagues time to sign on. And welcome again. Um, I believe many of uh, our colleagues have now had time to join us. My name is Barbara Preinsack. I'm I'm a professor at the Department of Political Science at the University of Vienna, and I'm also the chair of the European Group on Ethics, um, which advises the European Commission. Um, and I'm really grateful to Catherine Litt Glittler and the Epidemic Ethics Framework Network for um, inviting me to chair today's event, which, and now the term framework appears, um, is on moral framework for collective action in epidemics. So there is, of course, a bit of what we call um, pandemic fatigue. Um, many colleagues who have been working very hard on um, everything having to do with pandemics and academics in the last couple of years um, have understandably uh, becoming a bit uh, tired of continuing to talk about epidemics and pandemics. But the issue that we are going to discuss today is of great relevance, and I think it's of relevance far beyond um, the ongoing pandemic um, and, and actually far beyond crises, health crises in general. Uh, it is, it concerns the alleged tension between collective goods on the one hand um, and individual rights and interests on the other. So during the pandemic, we have seen a instances of individual rights and interests being pitted against um, collective goods. And I think there are two ways of approaching this. And one is what um, the European Eth Group of Ethics has done to say that the, the idea that individual rights and interests and collective goods are in attention is to some extent rooted in a Western dualism where where the two levels are almost like a zero-sum game where one has to give in order, for the, in order for the other one to gain, when in reality, in many situations, um, collective goods such as public health actually is a precondition for individual rights and interests to be protected and to be realized. And the same goes the other way around. So maybe there are many situations where the two of them are aligned rather than in a conflict. But I think there's also a sort of pragmatic level where we have bioethic traditions on the one hand with um, a very strong focus on individual respect, individual rights, individual autonomy, and public health ethics with a stronger focus on public, on, 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 the, on the public and the public's collective needs and interests. And public health ethics is very much associated with emergency situations. And what we have experienced in the last years was an, a public health emergency that became, in a way, the new normal for many people. And I'm, of course, conscious of all the good criticism of the problematic use of the term the new normal because it normalizes a situation that has grave consequences for many people. But there's also some truth in it in the sense that the new normal means that we have to live with an emergency that becomes um, that that has to become integrated in in daily routines and daily lives for people. So this this balancing of what people need to get through their daily lives, their individual needs, their freedoms, and the continuing need to respect and enhance our collective goods is something that maybe needs to be thought together in a different way. The, the normalization of emergency, as some people call it, as of emergency ethics. So this is a huge topic and um, we, will, we would ideally take many days to discuss it and not just an hour, but I'm sure that this hour today um, will be very interesting. We have a fantastic um, group of panelists here. Before I will introduce them and before I will ask the panelists to give us their um, initial input statements. Um, let me introduce um, today's speakers. So we have uh, Diane Lokovec, 
Um, she's the global coordinator of uh, the collective service at the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies in Geneva. Um, she uh, has over 15 years of experience in the humanitarian and global health fields. Um, Diane has worked for Gavi, for the WHO, um, and most recently for the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. In her mo most recent role with the IFRC, and until um, early 2022, so last year, she coordinated the Gavi um, Civil Society Organization constituency and contributed very successfully to a new Gavi Civil Society cooperation and engagement strategy. The answer interests include access and right to healthcare, gender equity, and also improving development assistance coordination at a global level. Um, Diane's presentation will be uh, followed seamlessly by a um, presentation by Rachel James. Um, she is the interagency RCCE coordinator, um, the collective service at UNICEF Eastern Southern Africa Regional Office in Nairobi in Kenya. And um, based with UNICEF ISARO, she leads uh, this interagency team as part of the collective service, which is a partnership between the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, UNICEF, and the WHO to support regional and country partners and ministries of health in East and Southern Africa in the risk communication and community engagement approaches to improve coordination and also to improve uh, collective action. Um, of and utilization of social and behavioral data to drive community-centered approaches in public health emergency responses, including COVID-19, um, cholera, and Ebola virus disease. Before she joined the collective service, Rachel worked in social and behavioral change programs in East and Southern Africa, focusing on women's and children's health programming. Um, our third speaker, will be Anand Ban. Um, he's a physician and bioethicist. Um, he has degrees from the University of Toronto and today is a researcher in global health, bioethics, uh, mental health and also health policy. He's an adjunct professor at Yenaboya and Mangalaro, India and was past president of the International Association um, of Bioethics from 2017 to 2019. So Anand works, focuses on ethics and equity in health, and mental health, also digital health, public health ethics, research ethics, community engagement, and the ethics of innovation, innovative technologies and ethics training for professionals. Anand um, is based at Bhopal in India, where he's also a mentor and principal investigator on grants with Sangath, which is a civil society organization. He's also and important in this context, a member of the WHO COVID-19 Ethics and Governance Working Group and the steering committee of the Global Forum for Bioethics and Research, and also um, the CIOMS Working Group on Good Governance Practice for Research Organizations. And last but not least at all, um, Diego Silva is a senior lecturer in bioethics at Sydney Health Ethics and the Sydney of, uh, at the University of Sydney School of Public Health. Um, his research centers on public health ethics, uh, particularly the application of political theory in the context of infectious diseases and health security, for example, in the area of tuberculosis, but also COVID-19 and antimicrobial resistance, which of course many people consider the next epidemic. Um, Diego adopts a mixed methods approach to his work. He uses qualitative methods and also conceptual analysis. And maybe it's worth mentioning also that Diego is currently the chair of the Public Health Ethics Consulta Consultative Group at the Public Health Agency of Canada and works closely with the World Health Organization of various um, public health ethics topics and also on an ad hoc basis. So um, a few notes of uh, housekeeping before um, I will ask Diane to, to start with the, uh, with the, the input statements. Um, we have the uh, Q&A function in this webinar um, where we invite you, and I think some colleagues have already started doing so, we invite you to ask questions for any or all of the speakers. Um, 
We also ask everyone to like questions that other colleagues have posed that you deem particularly important so that we can prioritize those. And a short reminder that this webinar will be recorded and it will be available on, at the Epidemic Ethics website and also, and some of you might be watching us on Facebook and listening to us on Facebook, it will also be available on the Facebook uh, website of the um, Epidemic Ethics uh, Network. So um, over to you, Diane. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barbara, and hello, everyone. I'm very pleased to be here with you. Uh, it's an honor for, for me and I think for Rachel as well to be invited um, to present uh, a few thoughts that we have on the collective service work and very much related to, to your field of expertise around ethics and, um, and uh, epidemics. So without further ado, I'll share my screen. I hope you will all be able to see it. So I'll be starting with a few words of introduction uh, related to the collective service work. Um, so I'm the global coordinator of the collective service and Rachel is uh, the coordinator at uh, the SR uh, region level and she'll tell you a bit more about the regional level and country level work uh, that is uh, ongoing with the collective service. So uh, just a, a few notes on, in, in terms of the background. So as you know, uh, back in 2020, when the pandemic, uh, COVID-19 pandemic hit, there was a, a clear uh, lesson learned uh, around risk communication and community engagement as, as a core pillar of the response to the pandemic. So that's why WHO, UNICEF and the IFRC uh, actually uh, um, came together to create the collective service and to launch it really with the idea to join forces and to make sure that the RCCE pillar was very much integrated into the response of key stakeholders that were really key, uh, clear actors of the response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this has actually evolved into the collective service that has been responding to other emerging public health emergencies such as MPOX, cholera, Ebola. And the RCC Collective Service is really trying to build structures and mechanisms that are required for better enhanced coordination of community-centered approaches that are really embedded into uh, national level uh, existing structures and for uh, clear outcomes in terms of engagement, uh, empowerment of communities that are uh, receiving uh, support, but also clear actors of their own uh, health um, and really making sure that they're at the core of the decision-making uh, in public health. This common approach is really critical, um, as you might know, to really make sure that we maintain and increase the level of trust um, from communities into their, uh, their uh, public health uh, structures really promoting uh, solidarity, equity, inclusivity, as well as, as well as coherence. And the idea of coordinated resources is also to make sure that we look for synergies and that we really bring forces together and that we look at each individual organization that is part of the collective service to make sure that they bring their own strength into uh, this global, regional and country efforts. And the idea is really to make sure that what we think is, is, is good, what we think that is right in terms of the response, which is really making sure that communities are put at the center of uh, the response, the preparedness um, is, is really there. So that's the whole kind of principle behind uh, the collective service. So collaboration is also very much of a key principle uh, behind the collective service, of course, uh, in order to be able to scale up, you know, coordination, technical assistance, and, uh, you know, an adequate response to PHEs. Um, it's also very much into localization, which means that uh, we make sure that local partners, actors are very much engaged uh, in the work that we're providing, be it in the coordination, be it with the information management, the data systems, a bit also within uh, social science support and expertise that we are providing through the collective service. So you see there is a wide range of uh, partners that we're working with uh, at global, regional and country level. 
You see the slide here with the core mission of the collective service um, and the principles behind the goals and the strategic objective. And as you see, it's very much uh, driven by the idea that, you know, with a, a collaborative mindset, with putting strength uh, uh, together, with really kind of uh, increasing the level of expertise and also localize it. Uh, there can be really an efficient uh, response and efficient efforts that are put into um, responding to uh, public health emergencies with a clear also uh, link to evidence-based um, um, information and decision-making. The type of uh, services that we provide is really around uh, coordination, information management, social science, uh, we also do have a system that it's called the community feedback mechanism to make sure that you know we actually um, you know go to communities and make sure that they are providing a feedback in all transparency uh, with really making sure that communities are trusting the system and that if things are not uh, going the way that they should, there's a way to track uh, issues and to actually report back to partners and national authorities to make sure that this also nurtures um uh, decisions and and you know sh potential shifts uh, in terms of the services uh, provided uh, in phes i'll uh move um you know and i'll give the floor to my colleague rachel who's gonna give you a bit more of a of an insight in terms of her work um in uh, east and southern africa rachel over to you Thanks so much, Deanne, and uh, very nice to um, to see you all here. Um, you know, we presented a lot of webinars um, and in a lot of regional and also um, global forum. But um, but you know, there's so many new colleagues on the list, so it's really nice to see you all. Uh, next slide. So I'm just going to give an overview of. Um, the uh, frameworks that we have um, at the regional level, but then also at the country level and some um, examples around how we've used them to respond to public health emergencies in the last year or so. So um, the collective service has been supporting regional and country level responses um, in East and Southern Africa. Um, at the regional level through um, a risk communication and community engagement technical working group. Uh, so this is co-led by UNICEF and the Red Cross IFRC but under a WHO-led um, health partners structure. And it was established in February 2020. And actually, it was established before um, the COVID-19 um, outbreak had come to um, East and Southern Africa and was really um, established as a lesson learned from previous Ebola outbreaks. Um, there was a lessons learned workshop in um, January 2020 in, um, in Nairobi that recommended the establishment of this structure. Um, and obviously that was a, a very timely, um, very timely recommendation. So um, this regional platform has been there um, since then, um, providing technical support to RCCE partners in the region. Um, and this has included the development of tools and guidance, um, sharing of lessons learned and best practices. So partners will um, share um, any updates that they have, different social science uh, research findings, findings from community feedback, but also uh, recommendations on how we can better engage with communities, um, how we can share um, more evidence-based key messages um, around risk communication um, in the case of outbreaks. So we've had this focus on strengthening RCCE coordination. So bringing partners together, having uh, coordinated responses at global um, as well as regional and at national level. Um, this coordination is also around the collection and utilization of social and behavioral data. Um, which includes community feedback for more community-centered responses. So in October 2021, um, there was a review of the structure and it was decided that um, it had been a really critical part of the response to COVID-19 in the region. Um, and the decision was made to expand it to respond to other public health emergencies and also the health component of humanitarian crises. So in addition to having this regional platform, we also have um, a small team that um, countries and partners in the region can request in-person and also remote support for across a menu of services. So this includes support around strengthening RCCE coordination, um, establishing and strengthening community feedback systems, undertaking social science um, to better understand community perceptions and behaviours. And then also this is underpinned by monitoring and evaluation and information management. Next slide. 
So the key recommendations or approaches that we prioritize um, around RCC in the region um, are really around strengthening coordination through the Ministry of Health across different partners. And a lot of what we do is advocating for different partners and also donors to provide um, updates on the work that they're doing in terms of RCC across different outbreaks um, through this RCC coordination with the Ministry of Health to provide updates on different social science um, uh, data collection and utilization exercises. So recommending that partners are using existing data, so doing data syntheses when there are outbreaks or, or prior to outbreaks, um, using rapid research to deepen understanding of key community concerns. And this might be after doing uh, maybe more quantitative data collection around a knowledge attitudes and practices survey. Um, and then also strengthening multi-channel community feedback systems. So the way that we're collecting community feedback, which could be through online means, so social media monitoring or media monitoring. Um, it might be through um, talking to um, households, through community dialogues, um, and also just around um, the collection of data through different community engagement activities. And then we really advocate for um, analyzing these findings across different partners and channels so that um, those findings can be shared and acted on in a coordinated way. Um, and then finally, we really emphasize um, harmonize and then also two-way communication and community engagement. So making sure that we're not just telling communities how to behave, but we're really trying to understand what their perceptions are, what their barriers are to behaving um, uh, in, uh, in a way that um, promotes health, uh, particularly during outbreaks. Um, next slide. So just to share a couple of, of examples. Um, so we supported um, the Ebola outbreak in Uganda um, last year. Um, and really this focused on building on the existing RCC platforms uh, for collective response. A lot of these platforms have been put in place during COVID-19 or maybe prior um, as part of other um, Ebola outbreaks. So at the country level, it was supporting um, the Ministry of Health um, to coordinate partners around the community engagement, uh, the community risk communications pillar, um, establishing the community feedback system. Um, and then jointly reviewing the community feedback and anthropology findings um, across the different pillars. We also provided support um, at the regional level um, and supporting partners in country th through the development of different tools um, and providing lessons learned to other countries that were also preparing for the response. Um, uh, if you can go to the final slide. So I'll just skip over um, the Malawi cholera slide, but it's a similar way that we've engaged there. So just the final slide, I'll just recap. I wanted to share what the counterfactual would be. So if we had outbreak responses without coordination and collective action. So you would have a duplication of efforts with partners working in isolation um, based on what funding was available or what donor priorities were, but not sharing their activities um, across other partners. You would have some communities being overwhelmed by responders, uh, while you would have other communities um, finding it uh, being much more easily engaged while some other communities uh, that are harder to reach wouldn't be. And we would see um, unharmonized messaging, which results in community confusion if they're getting a lot of different messages from different partners. We would see community feedback collected by specific partners, but not shared and not acted on. And we wouldn't be able to leverage the different strengths that partners bring. So different um, work that's done by social scientists or by community engagement and risk communication actors. And finally, we would have challenges for sharing um, oper operational recommendations for action um, based on all of that data, um, which would result in the funding not being targeted to the most critical areas. Okay, thanks uh, colleagues, uh, back to you, Barbara. Thanks very much, Diane and uh, Rachel. Uh, we are now moving on to Anand. Uh, and uh, we this discussion, very interesting work also with the RCC. Interesting uh, for us to have this webinar as the 75th World Health Assembly is ongoing in Geneva with, uh, with the theme health for all 75 years of improving public health. Uh, you know, if you look at the pandemic experience for global health, there's been a lot of action and attention given to the pandemic and the unique challenges that sort of unleashed from queries around pathogen origins, pathogen surveillance, reporting requirements, surveillance, health system response, testing requirements, treatment regimens, and their evidence base case reporting and then mortality estimates and doubts around that, vaccine development, deployment, equity in access to therapeutics and vaccines, trying to understand safety, efficacy, risk, long-term protection in times of emergency use listing, 
and also the follow-up of patients to understand their longer-term disease experiences. So the whole discussion around long COVID, for example. Uh, you know, this is the context in which I think our discussion is situated. And, and this is where, I guess, you know, the need for ethics and ethical values, values becomes sort of um, reinforced to my uh, understanding during the pandemic. Um, to my sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, again, thought, this, the most important role as I see it is perhaps for ethics and ethics values to be providing guidance and clarity during times of distress and quick decision making. Uh, you know, it, it can be because what it could do at the heart of it would help remind stakeholders involved uh, for the need to focus on areas such as integrity, transparency, uh, accountability. Uh, the need to have governance mechanisms, um, and also the need to do public and community engagement. Uh, what we saw during the pandemic was that governments and health systems were looking at a variety of options of response, uh, but this also needed ethics-infused thinking. You know, for example, they had to take uh, decisions around how to screen, how to isolate and quarantine in a non-stigmatizing way, uh, the role of mandatory enforcement, whether that be for testing, whether that be for vaccination, how to allocate resources, how to do rationing, you know, triage decisions, both in a clinical and public health scenario, uh, the decisions to shut down health interventions. Often, you know, hosp entire hospitals were, for example, shut down to primarily focus on only COVID care. Uh, all of these were important decisions, but they brought their own um, ethics uh, challenges, moral challenges, which, which needed to be dealt with. Uh, but ethics and ethics values and principles will only be useful when those who are in positions of power are able to understand uh, how these can be leveraged. And this was perhaps a gap, uh, uh, and, and, and majorly so in many health systems, uh, because uh, ethics and ethics values were not very clearly infused in the way decisions were taken. A lot of decisions were sometimes even taken from outside the health se uh, sector. For example, in many countries, we saw police, law ministries, interior or home ministries, being the ones who were driving the decision making and not necessarily uh, the health departments or ministries. And this is where I think if we had um, sort of moral compasses available, it could have helped better. You know, if you're trying to persuade anyone, uh, it will depend on them knowing that they, whatever they are agreeing to has been designed, uh, acknowledging their interests in mind, uh, even if it might not be a decision that they wanted um, originally to be, uh, you know, because they would likely want something which works in their favor. But this requires, of course, a more nuanced understanding of common interests and also an understanding that public health operates at a population level. That we might have to, for example, sacrifice individual rights, uh, especially during health crises and pandemics, but in a well thought through way, uh, and that this is done in a fair manner. Um, but this, again, is situated in the experiences of many parts of the world where communities, individual stakeholders face favoritism, face exclusion, face corruption, which is often not spoken about openly, but is the reality of everyday lives, um, including in the way health experiences um, are, are, are underwent. So we need to recognize that many individuals, communities, families underwent a lot of trauma during the pandemic. This included, for example, even financial damages and this enhanced their susceptibility, their vulnerability. Even that already healthcare access can be, for example, a major cause for indebtedness in, in many contexts. This could, of course, make them further wary of engaging uh, with health systems and, and sort of responses. So having clear guidance available for health systems to take accountability, to ensure quality, comprehensive care of communities, perhaps based on an ethics of care and justice requirement would be helpful but then only if it is implemented. You know, it's one thing to have very fancy guidance documents, but how do you ensure that these are implemented, that these are adopted, and these are at the heart of the response? Uh, the pandemic by itself, of course, brought an inordinate amount of attention to various entities. For example, governments, uh, high-income country governments, which were believed to be holding vaccines at a point of time, private industries, they were believed to be profiteering through exploiting misery, and Again, there needs to be some way to be able to appeal to these entities to be more sensitive to requirements around equity, around justice, around their own role for leadership at such times when there might be a temptation for them to focus on self-interest of their own jurisdictions or the profits of their shareholders. So was that really happening? Perhaps not adequately. Would there be better experiences in the future? It will really depend on having good frameworks um, and, and structures available, and maybe RCC is an example of, of that kind of change that we like to see. 
I would also tend to think that public health and frameworks, which have been developed uh, through the experiences of prior pandemic, SARS, um, uh, you know, H1, H, uh, H1N1, H5N1, et cetera, they would be very relevant in this discussion because they're sort of infused with the experiential knowledge of what has happened in the past. It's not that only during COVID-19 we face some of these unique questions and challenges. For example, the role of fairness. Uh, how do you ensure that uh, this is done in a way which is both procedurally and substantively given importance? Uh, there's been arguments made in the past during pandemics, for example, the need for the need for a fair decision making process, as well as equitable distribution of scarce human and material resources. But that requires us to keep fairness at the heart of our response. The other important, uh, you know, uh, values or principles would be openness, transparency um, at various levels, both at supranational levels where countries would be sharing data more proactively to help launch early responses to within the country, intra-country, where one would expect the population to know what is happening with regards to spread, what kind of preparation is there, what they can access from the health system, expectations from them in terms of their role in the response. And this is where I think trust is another key facet. You know, and trust doesn't develop overnight. I mean, the trust which communities might have or might not have in the health systems. Our own work um, in this domain, uh, especially in trying to understand experiences of marginalized communities such as the transgender community and the disability community in India during the pandemic has shown that how historical experiences of exclusion in the health system shape how they intersect with the pandemic response, whether they believe, whether they participate um, in, in proactive uh, responses or requirements, including testing, including getting admitted, including taking vaccination, et cetera. And we need to acknowledge that as, as sort of longer term inequities which communities might have faced. Uh, and of course, this is connected to the need for responsiveness. If our preparation and our approaches are not recognizing the need for designs uh, to be looking at how are we serving the, the communities which are part of the health system, the need for adaptation as needs change, as new evidence emergencies, uh, then there is a problem with our pandemic response. So I'll stop here, but hopefully this will give us some thought, uh, you know, some food for thought for discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anand, and I'm particularly grateful that you mentioned and you highlighted how experiences of exclusion shape response to pandemic measures, which I think is, is true all over the world and is not seen as, um, it's not considered sufficiently by, by policymakers. I think it's partly also because we still think of um, compliance with pandemic measures as a matter of a sort of choice and not, yeah, so it's very, very helpful um, what we have heard from our three speakers so far. We have one more to go. And last but not least at all, um, Diego. Great. Thanks very much, Barbara, for chairing our session. And I want to thank the organizers for their invitation as well. Uh, I want to begin by acknowledging that I'm currently speaking to you here in Sydney, which is land of the Gadigal people of the Yonora Nation. This is and continues to be unceded territory. Um, earlier today, the new chief science officer of the WHO, Jeremy Farrar, highlighted on his Twitter feed that the former prime minister of New Zealand, Jacinda Ardern, stressed the importance of, quote, science, solutions, solidarity, end quote, in her address to the World Health Assembly. Yet the pessimist in me would argue that the COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated once and for all that high-income countries are incapable of acting in a solidaristic manner with low- and middle-income countries. Politicians from high-income countries continually uh, invoke the idea of solidarity in the context of global health. But the lack of anything resembling equitable vaccine distribution, the travel bans and restrictions placed upon South Africa and its neighbors at the discovery of the Omicron variant of SARS-CoV-2, along with examples of data and sample hoarding during uh, previous Ebola and H5N1 outbreaks, suggest that resource-rich countries are incapable of playing nice with others. Of course, our inability to work cooperatively, particularly with politically marginalized communities, shouldn't come as a surprise given the colonial and racist history of public health in the 19th and 20th centuries, a history of subjugating non-white people under the guise of hygiene, especially as it relates to infectious diseases. Luckily, over the last 10 to 20 years, we've begun seeing an acknowledgement and reckoning of and with this history. Still, 
It's this colonial and racist history that provides the present day backdrop for pandemic planning and responses, and for our purposes is the context in which we create and deploy moral frameworks. Those of us working in public health and global health ethics must ask ourselves, for whom do we write moral frameworks and towards what end? Moral frameworks are or should be written with various stakeholders in mind, including those who hold power and those who do not. The ends of moral frameworks are, and apologies for the obviousness, to ensure decisions are made during pandemics um, are those that are most ethically defensible. With that in mind, I would argue that we ought to write moral frameworks that acknowledge historical injustices while acknowledging historical and present day struggles to overcome these injustices. Doing so, however, would mean writing frameworks that may irritate some constituents while emboldening others. In such instances, when we cannot serve everyone, we should err on the side of working with and for persons and communities that are marginalized. So, are there things more important than collective action? My answer is yes, kind of, it depends. I wanna suggest that justice will sometimes demand that we work collectively, but not for everyone, and not to further the interests of those in power and those who benefit from the status quo. Trying to define or come to some core foundational understanding of what constitutes justice in the time allotted is a foolish game. But one historical starting point stemming from the Emperor Justinian actually serves us well here. He claimed that justice is, quote, the constant and perpetual will to render to each their due, end quote. Parenthetically, I note the irony of speaking about justice from the mouth of an emperor. As a matter of fair procedure, our colleagues and decision makers in low and middle income countries are due to be heard about what they think are the values that should be espoused in future moral frameworks. In the meantime, I would argue that moral frameworks that claim justice as a foundational concept should center those values and principles that give greater consideration to the interests of low and middle income countries than those of higher income status. Reciprocity, for example, which entails among other things, giving good for give received, would support the collective action on the part of low and middle income countries to withhold data unless they have received enforceable assurances from high income countries that high income countries will abide by the international health regulations and other global health instruments. To paraphrase what I said a moment ago, collective action grounded in justice does not mean working for or with everyone in mind at the same time. I'll end with what I think is another blunt truism. Public health and by extension pandemic planning and response is political, whether we like it or not. Therefore, the moral frameworks intended to guide various stakeholders during pandemics are political too, whether we like it or not. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diego. And thanks again to all of our speakers. I, we have received a number of questions um, from participants in advance, and we have some now in the q and I'd like to invite you again to uh, pose your questions in the Q&A tab and or like questions that other colleagues have posed. So one, one question that has come up a couple of times was a kind of um, proposal that came up a couple of times and that relates to one of the questions that we have received is the importance of involving communities and learning from community responses. Um, Rachel mentioned this, for example, and, and other colleagues have mentioned this as well. But how can we, how is it possible to, to scale the lessons learned from communities, from community responses and community engagement? How is that scalable? And how can we do that in a way that is not only relevant to an immediate specific health crisis and epidemic, how can we do that in such a way that it really provides a framework for action um, that also travels across um, different geographical and other contexts? I don't know whether anyone would like to answer that. I mentioned Rachel, but it could be any one of the panelists. Rachel, please. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, such a great question. And 
I think this is really the thing that the collective service has been trying to focus on um, around our responses in um, in SAR and um, at the global level. Um, like I was saying, establish out of lessons learned from Ebola. Um, and one of the lessons was around the need for this interagency coordination platform that allowed um, uh, community-based organisations that really represent frontline workers and responders, um, as well as um, other organisations like the UN donors to, to come together to be able to share what those lessons learned are, and also to be able to share what they're hearing from the community at all stages um, of a response. So um, the platforms that we've been able to put in place to collect community feedback, whether that's just from community dialogues where they're asking questions, where they're um, sharing their concerns around maybe the response of the government, for um, example, um, in Uganda around um, the different restrictions that we're focusing um, on the Ebola virus disease, which were particularly targeting five different districts, being able to understand what the community's perceptions were around that, whether they were whether they understood um, and were um, aligned with those or whether they had questions and concerns that needed to be addressed. Um, and then after, um, or you know, throughout the response, um, taking um, that community feedback data, adding to it around um, the social behavioral data that may be collected through anthropological studies or qualitative assessments to understand, um, to have this better understanding. Um, and then after the response, being able to use that um, to address uh, future responses. And we've seen that in um, Uganda already with their response um, to Magbo virus disease, where um, they were preparing for it in relation to the outbreak in Tanzania, but using a lot of the tools and the findings and the understandings that they had of the community to do so. Thanks. And um, this is, I think this also goes some way in addressing a problem that all of our speakers have acknowledged, namely that universalism, um, claimed universalism of a particular dominant approach of frameworks is not good enough and that we probably need to get to some kind of pluriversality in not only the solutions that are there and the instruments that we develop, but also in the way that questions are being framed. And I think what you've now said, Rachel, um, I, this is how I understand it also, um, follows a participatory um, spirit in, 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 in defining the questions that should be addressed. And it also, I think, resonates with what Diego said um, in terms of global justice, which we will return to. I think this was a, a fascinating program that is incredibly difficult to implement, but very, very important. I'm coming to another question that, that um, our colleagues have asked us, and I think that's something that many of us know from our own experience. So most of us fly the flags of um, making ethical values or, or helping ethical value, making ethical values help shape policy responses and making ethical values explicit. But how do we do that when there's an acute health emergency, when there's a big pressure, when the stakes are very high and when there's insufficient time? Isn't ethics, aren't values, isn't all of what we're now talking about a kind of ex post rationalization because it's um, unpractical and idealistic to assume that this could be considered in, in, a, in an acute crisis when decision making needs to happen fast? Diego. I think values will get will, will be espoused during an outbreak and during a pandemic, whether we like it or not. I think what we have a choice about is what are the values that we want to espouse. So that ethics won't come into play, I don't think is, is true. I think it's, it's more so that whether we want to, which values do we want expressed in the decision-making that we do? It's true that time-sensitive situations will require sort of quick and dirty thinking, but I think as many of us have pointed out, um, that and, and I think it's been a point made in previous editions of, of this uh, seminar series, which is a lot of these decisions, a lot of the thinking needs to occur in that sort of intra pandemic intra outbreak situ you know moments as well, uh, when we do have time to think. 
So I think that I think that we're we're going to be engaged with values regardless of what it is we choose to do. It's just up to us which values we want to express. And and Diego, follow up. Do you do you see that there's a in principle opposition between more individual focused values and more collective focused values? So is is bioethics and public health ethics that needs to be brought together in such a situation, or is that a kind of false binary? Yeah, I mean, look, I think this is a really big question. I think that the sort of the purported tension between bioethics and public health ethics, I think sometimes gets overblown in practice. But in in terms of the what's good for the individual versus what's good for the community, I, I come back to something that you said in your opening remarks, Barbara, which I think is that oh, public health is good for the individual. Um, many have, have written about this, or a good handful of our colleagues have written about this, most notably the one that jumps to mind is, is James Wilson um, out of London who's written about the right to public health, and he makes that argument on the basis of autonomy. So I think there's going to be moments of tension, no doubt, but I do think that we ought not to overblow that in practice. Thank you very much, um, Diane. Thank you so much. I'll try to be quick. I think just responding to, to your question, uh, I think there's there's uh, there are different frameworks that are being um, developed right now, one of them being the uh, HEPR framework, which is the uh, health emergency uh, preparedness and response uh, that is being, uh, you know, led by WHO. Uh, and I think uh, just kind of echoing on, on what Diego has said, I mean, the, the, the importance of, you know, uh, emergency response also lies with the preparedness time that we have. And so really making sure that we you know, that partners allocate sufficient resources and time to actually be able to, you know, be ready when whenever a new emergency occurs. And I think this is really what we've seen in the last decade or so, including even with COVID-19, where, you know, probably the preparedness, uh, you know, bits of the work was not was not there yet. Uh, and this is also, you know, part of the, the collective service work is really to make sure that, you know, whatever we learn from you know, community feedback mechanisms from, you know, uh, feedback sessions from the different tools that we've just developed is that we're able also to nurture decision making at, you know, national, local level to be able to, you know, make sure that these communities are ready eventually for uh, any emerging uh, emergencies. Thank you very much, Tian. Um, Anand, you raised your hand and then I would like to come to the question that was posed here and also previously about um, international global uh, frameworks and how those can be meaningfully achieved. Um, Anand, please. So what I was saying is that uh, you know, they're, they're, in our pandemic response, we've also relied on this understanding that there are certain things which don't get sacrificed. For example, scientific method, integrity, the need for uh, transparency, right? And if we agree on those in the context of science, there would be also certain ethics or ethics values which would transcend even during the pandemic response. And it's it's just that that nuanced understanding needs to be there among policy makers, among communities, among folks who deliver um, services um, in health systems. And that's where I think the preparedness part that we are alluding to becomes important. Uh, the the challenge is when people think that these are the kind of things you can sacrifice in the name for a quicker response. And that's where I think communities start getting ostracized. Uh, communities start getting marginalized and, and these allegations around uh, favoritism, it's corruption, et cetera, start seeping in which breaks the trust, which is what the point I was trying to make. Thank you. I think that's a very important thing to emphasize as well, that if we are tempted to think that by leaving ethics and leaving values out, they're, they're in policy making anyhow, um, all the time. and it comes at the end um, at the cost of, 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 of people's needs as individuals and collectives and also uh, of people's buy-in. So I would like to move in the final round. Shockingly, it's already the final round. I'd like to move to a question that has been asked a couple of times, um, and that refers to, um, to global frameworks more generally, but also specifically um, to the WHO um, zero draft and the pandemic treaty negotiations. Um, and I would like to link that also to the global justice dimension that, that, that many of our speakers have mentioned in different ways. Um, can a global treaty, can a pandemic treaty deliver such a thing? Is it the right instrument? And if not, what else should be done? 
um, if I could invite our panelists to also use this as a kind of wrap up round, um, who would like to, to go first? Oh, oh bite. Um, look, I think that any, any reworking, so the pandemic treaty or the reworking of the IHR or whatever sort of global international documents that we're working on, um, I think it's terrific. I think we need these. Um, we see the normative language that's already in the pandemic treaty. But I think ultimately, regardless of what it is we do, whatever normative language we add, unless there are enforceable mechanisms to hold countries to account, particularly high-income countries, who we know weren't doing their fair share in terms of promoting equity and the solidarity that they purported to, to hold so dear, unless there's enforcement mechanisms, then we're going to be back here when the next pandemic happens. Um, we need to think creatively. We need to recognize what are the leverage points held by low and middle income countries, data, but otherwise, what, what are the other points? Um, and be realistic about this. If, um, if we want to achieve greater equity going forward, greater justice going forward, then I think we need to think really um, about what the real situation is in terms of um, history of injustice in public health and its modern day um, uh, reality. Thanks very much. So the leverage points are definitely part of the question because we have seen that high income countries are often not really willing to do that um, uh, on their own initiative. Um, thank you, Diego. Um, so uh, Rachel, Diane, Anand, would you like to add something here? And please feel free to expand my question to whatever else you would like to say. No, I think I would I would just uh, just comment on what Diego has said. I, I, I totally agree uh, with with your comments. I think one other uh, consideration is really around uh, the level of representation, uh, you know, when it comes to decision making and especially when it comes to developing this type, this type of treaties and agreements. Uh, what I've seen, at, at least in my experience, not only uh, with the collectuses, with with other, uh, you know, post uh, is that sometimes uh, some constituencies are left aside and not really uh, being brought to the table. And I think that's that's really where the rubber is going to hit the ground, if I may say. It's really making sure that whatever treaty is being uh, agreed upon is really a reflection of, of a diverse range of opinions and, and expertise, and that we make sure that whenever it's, it's being uh, implemented in, in countries, then it's being socialized um, you know, adequately, and then people feel they can they can own this uh, moving forward. And and sometimes, unfortunately, uh, it's it's not always the case. And I think there are some issues uh, related to the representation of different constituencies. I'm thinking about you know civil society organizations, uh, you know even private sectors sometimes uh, different type of private sectors entities uh, that are not always uh, there uh, at the table. Over. Thanks very much, Tian. Anand. But it's also important for us to recognize that even within low and middle income countries, you have the same issues around inequities, around positions of privilege, around certain people in those positions of privilege taking the decisions. And there is a huge implementation gap, which is what Diego was also alluding to. You could have fancy treaties at the global level. Sometimes even at the national level, you might have great guidance documents. But what do communities get to access on the ground is very much driven by, do we have those transparent mechanisms to hold people in positions of power accountable? Do we have communities aware of their rights? Do we have health systems which are really focused on providing wholesome health services, which are comprehensive in nature? And that goes much beyond the pandemic, right? The pandemic should not be a special case scenario where suddenly, for example, communities are seeing health systems coming out and saying, here's your vaccine, please take it. When for 40, 50 years of their lives, they've never seen a, a health worker come and ask them a simple question around what are your health needs, right? The pandemic should not be the only time when health systems interact with communities. And that is the kind of broader question in global health 
that we need to ask that why is it that we are not focusing on that and, and looking at pandemic exceptionalism in our responses sometimes. Thank you, Anand. Um, Rachel. Yeah, I mean, I would just um, just want to add on to that, and I completely agree. Um, in so many um, so many cases, like um, with Uganda, for example, uh, when they had the EVD outbreak, it may have been the first time that um, some of those communities had had um, so many responders um, there to to work with them, to provide information, to um, uh, share the different um, public health and social measures that were required as part of um, as part of the outbreak. But it's so important that um, that we are building trust um, between outbreaks and just as part of normal routine um, business as usual. And so that that piece around community feedback and establishing those systems, um, it, that's not something that um, needs to take place as the pandemic starts or as um, an outbreak commences. Ideally, we want to have some sort of system where we're continually engaging in two-way communication with these communities to better understand what their perceptions are, what their trust level in community health systems are. And we know that that's been damaged in a lot of uh, SR countries, particularly um, by COVID-19 and by um, the COVID-19 vaccine campaigns. So really thinking about how we can rebuild that trust and what kind of capacities we need to have in place to be listening to communities and acting on what their feedback is and what kind of um, structures and platforms do we need to have in place to coordinate responses um, to these different outbreaks and in response to um, the feedback and the perceptions and the behaviours that we're seeing during outbreaks and beyond them as well. Thank you very much, Rachel. Um, thank you everyone for being with us today. To me, it felt that the hour was far too short. Um, Thank you for everyone who asked questions and my apologies to those of you whose questions we could not answer in full. Um, the discussion will continue. This is also a reminder that um, the webinar has been recorded and it will be available um, at the Epidemic Ethics website and also at the Ethics uh, Epidemic Ethics um, Facebook page. I would like to... Um, uh, yeah, invite you to provide feedback. Um, Adam just put the link into the um, into the uh, chat function, so not the Q and A one, but the chat function. And um, I would like to thank again um, the Epidemic Ethics team for bringing us together and all our panelists today. Um, please join me in thanking them and be well and all the best to you. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thanks, everyone. And thank you, Barbara, especially.